told y'all before, I kind of like to do the uh, pop the papers thing, newsman thing before I start talking today. It's actually kind of a good day to do that because I got a lot of papers on my desk here. Hey, it's uh, Brandon Adams, the host of Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented by Marco's Pizza. Loving this Thanksgiving week, getting ready for clean old-fashioned hate on Saturday, and then you know what after that. We are busy today on our program. It's Jeff Sintel later on for a Marlowe's Tavern tell-all. We'll talk to Jeff about some of the freshmen that played and redshirt freshmen that played against UMass on Saturday. We'll get an update from Jeff about the expected visit this Saturday for the four-star running back Noah Kane. The guys that went to Tennessee on Saturday, we'll let Jeff weigh in on that, and we'll kind of do it all here. Uh, and also a lot more on the dogs and the jackets. So it's going to be a fun show. We're glad you're with us. If you've got some time off this week, thanks for spending it with us. As Dog Nation Daily, presented by Marco's Pizza, begins right now. From DogNation.com, this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented by Marco's Pizza. Here's your host, Brandon Adam. We have got a lot to do on today's show, but before we do any of it, I have got a huge announcement to make right off the top, and I want to even wait on this. Let me just get this out here because I'm really excited about a chance to share something with you coming up uh, two Saturdays from now. We're going to call it Road to Atlanta. We are on the road to Atlanta next Saturday, and as we get ready for that, one of the things that we'll have our, our eye on is the gigantic Road to Atlanta tailgate taking place at the Blue Lot next Saturday starting 11 a.m. I've had a lot of you asking, B.A., are y'all going to do the same thing this year that you did last year? Well, the essential answer is yes, we will. We're going to be there at the Blue Lot starting 11 a.m. right there on Northside Drive for our Road to Atlanta tailgate, getting ready for the big one. You know what that one is uh, there that evening uh, right inside the Mercedes-Benz Stadium. We're super excited about that. Let me show you the uh, graphic one more time here for the folks on video so I can thank the uh, sponsors for making it all possible. Our friends from Cadillac, Kroger, Pella Window and Door, and Marlowe's Tavern. What an awesome time it's going to be. So go ahead and make your plans. If you're on your way to the game there that day, 11 a.m., the Blue Lot Northside Drive for our Road to Atlanta tailgate. We'll all be on hand. All kinds of fun. Huge tailgate set up. I'll be telling you more about that in the days ahead but for now the thing to know is that you need to be there and be a part of that now speaking of road to atlanta we're also going to do, going to do our part over the next few days to prepare for what's going to happen next saturday in atlanta that means some extra special broadcasts we'll do our first one here today at 3 p.m so on the dog nation video channels the one you may be watching right now now if you're listening podcast or radio you'll have to find the dog nation folks on a video here but uh 3 p.m this afternoon we'll do our very first a uh, road to atlanta broadcast it's driven by cadillac and we'll get ready for the georgia bulldogs and the alabama crimson tide coming up uh next saturday we'll preview that today starting at 3 p.m and then every day next week we'll have an extra special in addition to a dog nation daily road to atlanta broadcast driven by cadillac with a whole lot of fun and surprises so we are certainly getting excited about what's going to happen in the ATL uh, next Saturday and really glad to have you as a part of that. With that said, though, there is some business to be taken care of for Georgia before we get to and finish on the road to Atlanta next week. So let's start our program with some of that right now. And in a, in a weird way, this is actually kind of all kind of tie together. Uh, Rodrigo Blankenship, the very popular Georgia kicker, and for those of you that don't always go to games, the one thing you should know is when the starting lineups are announced, offense, defense, and the key specialists, when the starting lineups are announced, the loudest ovation for any starter all year long, for the most part, has been Rodrigo Blankenship. It's always a really fun thing to see. And you understand the reason here. There's really a couple of them. In addition to Blankenship being among the very best kickers in the country, he's also this great personality. He's always been a lot of fun, and the fact that he's so good makes his personality even the more fun. Georgia fans just like Rodrigo Blankenship. You better believe then, given the fact that uh, dog fans have a great affinity for Blankenship, and as I said, Blankenship's had an incredible year and career thus far for the Georgia Bulldogs, there was outrage and fury, and that's not too strong of a phrase to use, outrage and fury yesterday when the Lou Groza Award, and I'll show you the tweet here on the screen, when the Lou Groza Award, the award that goes out to the nation's top kicker, uh, when the finalists were announced, Rodrigo Blankenship not among them. You see Cole Tracy there, two other guys I've never heard of. Uh, there's also a typographical error in here, so uh, the Groves Award not exactly putting its best foot forward, but they announce um, some finalists for the Groves Award, and Blankenship is not among them. It was amazing to see this tweet go out yesterday because when you started looking at all the replies and all the responses, I mean, it's immediate. 
just Georgia fans jumping in on this thing with both feet. Where is Rodrigo Blankenship? Why is he not among the uh, finalists? To Blankenship's credit, though, even though a lot of people were speaking out on his behalf, he wasn't necessarily in the fray. He was well above that. Incredibly classy from Blankenship. His response to all of this, uh, I'll show you that also as well here. Rodrigo, who's kind of always just been a, a pretty cool gentleman, once again, kind of the same thing, basically saying that he's got respect for all three of the guys who are Groh's Award finalists and the job they've done kicking field goals this season. Then he gives the hashtag kickers for people too and respect the specs kind of funnily there uh, in kind of a funny way there from Blankenship. So he downplays the fact that he's not a Groves Award finalist. I'm going to tell you right now, I don't care that, you know, in, in most years I wouldn't care the least bit about the Groves Award. But in a year like this, when Georgia's got a kicker like Blankenship, obviously I, I care about it greatly. And I think it's absolutely insane that a Blankenship's not among the finalists. And it's really almost hard to figure out how this goes down. Mike Griffith will be on the show tomorrow. I may ask Mike about that. He may have some more insight about how one of a national award like this could fail as spectacularly as the Groves Award has seemingly failed because it's not like Blankenship wasn't getting some attention at the beginning of the season. Let me go back to September when Bruce Feldman, uh, now of The Athletic, was on you know some national show. And even all the way back then, he was already paying attention to the Georgia kicking game. This is back in September. So you can't necessarily say that a Blankenship wasn't getting some attention. Feldman, a national rider who's got a fairly big platform, was already talking about him way back at the beginning of the season. Here's Bruce Feldman. The other thing that I feel like is vastly underrated with them, their kicking game is phenomenal. You know, if they get into close games, we're going to see that. So I think they're really well positioned. So that's obviously some praise for Feldman about Georgia, but he mentions the kicking game. He doesn't mention Blankenship by name, but he is the kicker. So it doesn't make any sense that a Blankenship would not be a, a Groves Award finalist. But maybe a consolation prize here for Georgia fans and maybe a consolation prize for Blankenship himself is the fact that what Feldman also points out there is that in close games, Rodrigo Blankenship is going to be a tremendous weapon. So I guess if I asked a Georgia fan, you could have the scenario where Blankenship wins the Groza Award or Blankenship is the missing difference in a Georgia win against Alabama, obviously Blankenship and every fan who likes Blankenship would take the latter over the former. They would love to see him be the difference against Alabama. And listen, let me be just very clear here. I think Alabama beating that team next Saturday is going to be incredibly difficult to do. But if it does happen, I truly believe that Rodrigo Blankenship might be the reason why, at least among the chief reasons why. I even wrote about this a little bit on Friday in my Buy the Numbers piece at DogNation.com, and many of you are kind enough to read the stuff that I write at DogNation.com in addition to listening to me or watching me here on Dog Nation Daily, and I always really appreciate that. Buy the Numbers is this thing where I kind of look at some stats that I find interesting and kind of write about why I think they're interesting. I have a good time doing it. I don't know if people have a good time reading it or not, but I, I certainly enjoy doing it. And one of the things that I pointed out last week is if you look at the situation with Georgia and Alabama right now, and I told you yesterday I'm going to try to talk mostly about Tech here this week, but I can't help but talk about Alabama when I mention Blankenship because I don't think that Georgia's going to need Blankenship to beat Georgia Tech. Uh, so, so, you know, Alabama comes up in, in this discussion, in other words. If you look at uh, Bill Conley, who's kind of a famous college football math guru, writes for a footballstudyall.com, he has these you know, efficiency rankings and, and, and position group rankings. And in his special teams ratings, you know that Georgia's 10th best in the country? Now that includes more than just the place kicker, but 10th best out of 130 teams is pretty good. And it's a huge advantage in comparison to Alabama, who's just 96th in those same rankings. The reason why Alabama ranks so low, uh, Crimson Tide with two different kickers has actually missed six extra points this season. And can you believe that? Extra points are virtually guaranteed. They're almost automatic, but Alabama's missed six of them. They've had to replace a, a kicker already this year, and the guy they put in missed a couple uh, just as recently as uh, two weeks ago. This is a disaster for Alabama when it comes to place kicking. Inside Mercedes-Benz Stadium, in perfect conditions, no wind, uh, when, when kicking games could be at their, uh, at their most important. I think Blankenship could be a huge weapon for UGA. So the overall bottom line for me is the Groza Award snubbing Blankenship looks ridiculous. If the SEC championship game plays out the way that I think it might, it'll look even worse after that game because if you really want to pin your hopes on the fact that Georgia might be able to win this game, I think one of the guys you got to think about prominently is Rodrigo Blankenship. I think he could be a difference maker. And if that's the case, the Georgia fans that cheer him so loudly in Athens every single Saturday will no doubt be plenty happy come December the 1st. 
My name is Brandon Adams. It's Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented by Marco's Pizza. Hello to you. Thanks for being with us. No matter how you get to us today, live on video, 10 a.m., Dog Nation Facebook, YouTube, Twitter feed, radio at noon on Athens Sports Radio 960 The Rep, and in podcast form, wherever podcasts can be found, including the world-famous dognation.com. We're really glad you were with us today. Really appreciate Marco's Pizza for making it all possible. Of course, you know that Marco's treats every day like game day. They always bring their best, which means dough made fresh, original sauce recipe, three signature cheeses on every pizza. It's every store every day, the Italian way. So say hello, Primo, by ordering yours from marcos.com. We'll get Jeff Sintel on our program in uh, just a moment. Before we do that, though, I want to go around the doghouse here on this particular day, brought to you by our friends at Brasstown Valley Resort and Spa. I got some big news to tell you about Brasstown Valley Resort in just a moment. Before that, though, uh, let me (laughs) say that what a great time I had last Thursday. I got a chance to go up to the uh, beautiful Brasstown Valley Resort and Spa in a lovely Towns County, Georgia. What an awesome, awesome resort this is. The day that I was there, had, had a chance to eat lunch in the dining room. Beautiful fire crackling in the fireplace. They were actually getting decorated for Christmas while I was there, which is really exciting. They've got a huge, huge event coming up uh, for uh, Christmas. This is a beautiful resort with mountain views. I'm talking about everywhere you go, panoramic all the way around. I, I just had such a great time. Charles, the general manager and the entire staff at the uh, Brasstown Valley Resort and Spa, really rolled out the uh, red carpet for us last week when we were there. I want to tell you more about them coming up. Let me go around the doghouse before we get there, though. And I talked about this briefly on DN90 yesterday, a video series that you may have seen from us here at Dog Nation. The Georgia Tech wide receiver, Brad Stewart, little bulletin board material, little trash talk maybe, looking back to his uh, previous appearance in Athens in 2016 when Georgia Tech won. I mean, as we pointed out, Tech actually won the last two trips. It's made to uh, Sanford Stadium, and Brad Stewart was bragging about that. I think we've got the uh, quote we can show here of Stewart talking about being 1-0. and Yeah, he says, all I'm saying is, is I played there one time, I'm 1-0. and It was a good feeling tearing down those hedges at the end. So I want to do that again. That's, I guess, been a little bit of a tradition for uh, Georgia Tech with the rare opportunity they've gotten to get a win in Athens. They've enjoyed tearing uh, down the hedges and ripping those apart when it's happened. And really, I, I kind of predicted that I thought this would become one of the backdrop focal points of the week, and it certainly seems like it has. I thought that Chip Towers, the uh, longtime beat reporter covering UGA for Dog Nation, when he was with us on Dog Nation Daily yesterday, I thought he had a very, a couple very provocative comments about that, about just how much the idea of stopping Georgia Tech from doing this might motivate and galvanize Georgia here heading towards the weekend. Here's an example of that from uh, yesterday, uh, Chip Towers on Dog Nation Daily. Look, the last two times Georgia Tech was here, they absolutely ravaged the hedges. There's nothing that gets... Georgia fans more fired up than their sacred hedges. Their intention is to come tear them up again. So I don't know how much that uh, Kirby and his staff will be showing video of hedges getting torn up, but I imagine that's going to be a big part of the motivation here. And we should also point out that uh, Georgia Athletic Director Greg McGarity was quoted at Dog Nation yesterday and saying, oh, this, you know, tearing up the turf that Georgia has done at Tech or tearing up the hedges, which uh, Tech has done at Georgia, that's not going to be a part of this rivalry going forward. That's a- an AD saying what ADs need to say. But in terms of the actual situation on the ground, I think Georgia stopping Tech from doing this is going to be actually a-, a great piece of bulletin board material and a great motivation for the uh, dogs on Saturday. And I think that Georgia has proven in the past to just be really good at using these kinds of things but as chip explained it's not just keeping the hedges from being torn down it's also preserving something that i believe that georgia has uh, become pretty proud of and that's that uh, unbeaten mark at home they did it last year they want to do it again this year too it's protecting your turf georgia has a wall dedicated on the first floor of the butts mayor football complex to the teams over the years who have been undefeated at home and there's no coincidence that those teams mostly ended up in either SEC championships or national championships or played for them. It's about protecting your home turf, and this is Georgia's last opportunity to do that. This is a proud group. They're not going to want to go out with a, another loss to Georgia Tech. That'll be a big part of the motivation of the Bulldogs this week. I thought it was pretty cool that Chip Towers said that on our show on Monday morning, and then a couple of hours later when Kirby Smart spoke to the media, 
he essentially said the same thing, that, yeah, you know what, being undefeated and being the kind of Georgia team that's capable of sweeping its uh, schedule at home, that is the hallmark of the best Georgia teams and the kind of group that this group of seniors and all the scholarship players in the 28 team want to see a part of their uh, great legacy. Here's uh, Kirby Smart echoing Chip Tower Center. That's been a message all year. It's not been about tech, obviously. It's been about the teams that have been championship teams that have defended their home turf. We've got a bulletin board about it. You know, when you win your games at home, it gives you a much better chance of winning the East. When you win your games at home, it gives you a much better chance of winning the SEC. And uh, we've talked about that all along, and we want to continue to do that. And I think that's a big part of it, not because it's tech, but because it's our home stadium. And uh, we want our fans to come out, support these guys, even over Thanksgiving break. It's critical that we have the momentum and the fan base behind us to make it an advantage for us. I hope you heard that at the end. There's a challenge for fans in there. Obviously, the Saturday after Thanksgiving can be kind of a sleepy time. People have either eaten too much the couple days before that or they're too busy shopping and getting their own decorations put up. Kirby Smart says you got to prioritize clean old-fashioned hay because it's a big deal to these players, seniors included, to go out with a win against uh, Georgia Tech. They're motivated by that, and they want fans to be motivated by that as well. My guess is Dog Nation will heed Kirby Smart's cry when it comes to uh, something like that, and Georgia will go out and protect its turf. And no matter you know what Greg McGarity and Todd Stansbury, the two ADs, say, that, that's still going to be a galvanizing issue for this rivalry, keeping that turf from being torn up or those hedges from being torn up, and I'm guessing Georgia uses that to its advantage. Around the doghouse here on Tuesdays, brought to you by Brasstown Valley Resort and Spa, and as I said a moment ago, it is the perfect place to go during the holidays. What a beautiful, beautiful location right there in Towns County, Georgia. I saw it myself. They're getting the, the Christmas decorations up, those holiday lights uh, being hung, the trees being put up. It's all fantastic stuff, and make sure you act right now to take advantage of the special Brasstown Valley Dog Nation special, which is uh, only for Dog Nation uh, daily listeners. You can get 20% off any room booked between now and uh, March 31st. Uh, you just got to go to Brasstown valley.com and use the promo code dog 18 that's spelled d-a-w-g dog 18 to uh, take advantage of that offer the uh, discounts available until december 31st and it's subject to availability blackout rates apply also huge news here it's the final week to enter the get out of the doghouse uh, giveaway we've been bragging about this thing for a while and the uh, time to uh, finally uh, shut this thing down is coming up so get in there and get registered if you haven't already one lucky winner is going to receive a four-day three-night trip to for two to brasstown valley resort spa which includes spa treatment stable trail rides two rounds of golf with card and more simply go to get out of the doghouse.com to enter that's get out of the doghouse.com to enter uh, dog spell the way it's supposed to be d-a-w-g i was there last week this is a beautiful place if you haven't been there you've got to go see brasstown valley resort and spa great to have you with us here today on our dog nation daily we'll hear more from kirby smart later on let's talk to jeff sintel right now From Athens and across the SEC or wherever the recruiting trail may lead, here's a DogNation.com insider. Boy, I tell you, it is such a busy time for us here around Dog Nation. As we start our uh, uh, Marlowe's Tavern Tell All, I will tell you coming up in a couple of minutes how you can be a part of our huge Road to Atlanta live special uh, next week at the uh, Marlowe's in Brookhaven. We'll tell you about that coming up in just a couple of minutes. But we got some business to take care of with Jeff Sintel before we get there. Jeff, happy Thanksgiving week to you. I hope that you are getting ready to enjoy it, eating some turkey and spending some time with friends and family and probably uh, enjoying a little bit of football too. Uh, we certainly appreciate you being back on our program today, and we are certainly thankful for your recruiting information that you provide to us each week, and it's uh, good to have a chance to speak to you here once again. Oh, uh, man, Brandon, uh, glad to be here. Happy Thanksgiving to everybody out there early. Happy Black Friday shopping to all those poor dads and children out there who have to endure all that. And, uh, Brandon, favorite Thanksgiving side dish, man, what do you got? You know, I guess I'm pretty traditional on this kind of stuff. I do like the mashed potatoes. I like the macaroni and cheese. As long as it's not green, I'm probably okay with it. You know, corn. I, I'm all about the starchy uh, Thanksgiving sides for the most part. I, I don't really like anything that's green or really anything that's too casserole to be honest with you. Uh, but, you know, just give me some classic mashed potatoes, uh, a lot of butter, you know, not too not too runny, uh, you know, some good, you know, yellow, golden yellow corn. Give me some macaroni and cheese. <laughs> I'm all about all that kind of stuff. Now, this is a big question, Brad. Is it dressing? Or is it stuffing around your Thanksgiving table? What What is it for you, man? Look, we're, we don't live in Brooklyn, New York. We're down in the South. It's, <laughs> it, it, it's dressing for us down here. Plus, uh, if you do truly stuff your uh, your dressing into your turkey and cook it, you're going to get salmonella. I mean, that, that's been well documented. 
<laughs> there you go, guys. So there, there is some Thanksgiving intel right there from BA.com. Good job. Man. All right. So, uh, Jeff, is uh, Noah Kane still coming on Saturday? Oh, uh, phew. Uh, the la- latest report I got from them is that this was one of those situations where uh, they were going to – they have a very measured approach. They were not going to deviate from that path whatsoever. Um you know, there's a lot of lot of noise right there regarding Texas with Noah Kane. Uh, that's the school that I would think looks like the team to beat for Noah Kane, and it's just going to depend on how that conversation goes in terms of uh, uh, Noah Kane and whether uh, he ends up at a school like Georgia. So let me uh, follow up on that then with a couple things. It, it sounds like, and we talked about this on Before the Hedges and on Dog Nation Daily, you know, all official visits for the most part always go well, I guess except for the one that Hazelwood recently took to Auburn. But for the most part, every other official visit goes really well. But the Texas visit for Kane a couple of weeks ago went better than well, it seems like. And if I'm hearing you correctly, and I'll let you correct the record if I'm not, if I'm hearing you correctly, it sounds like you believe that Texas may be trying to dissuade Kane from coming to Georgia on Saturday. Is that is that me reading between the lines correctly with what you're trying to say here? No, I think you're, you went a little too deep dive on there with your scuba suit there, sir. I, I just think that uh, I just think that Kane, you know, he, he's already canceled the uh, the visit to uh, Ohio State. Uh, the LSU visit will probably be an LSU official in name only. And really, I think the young man needs something to compare uh, whatever school might be his private leader, or whatever that might be, or whatever school he thinks might end up um, being his choice. You know, there's Penn State, there's Auburn. There's Georgia, there's Texas. Uh, those are the four schools. LSU is still supposedly going to get a last official visit there as well. Uh, but you know, Kane also is going to make his decision in Dallas on uh, December the 19th. Now, that's where he's originally from. Uh, I guess people would read in way too much if he was making that decision in Austin, Texas. But um, I think that right there is a, a situation that needs to be monitored. And, and this is kind of what the storyline has been all along. It's been uh, he needs to sit down in front of Georgia. Uh, heart-to-heart, faces-to-faces with uh, Kirby Smart, Jim Chaney, Del McGee, and the like. Uh, this has been a long recruitment uh, for uh, for uh, Noah Kane, even involving Georgia, because the Georgia and Del McGee was the first school that actually worked him out uh, when he was emerging as a prospect. So I still think for a lot of those reasons that he uh, – very likely will end up at, uh, on the official visit, at least, to Georgia on Saturday. It's the uh, Marlowe's Tavern Tell-All with Jeff Sintel here on Dog Nation Daily. And Marlowe's heating up its menu with new food and drink favorites conducive to warm, friendly gatherings on chilly afternoons or evenings. It's tantalizing new offerings, which include feta and artichoke fondue, barbecue chicken cob wrap, and the classic cocktail known as the Jet Plane. And I love when Marlowe's puts out new items. They always make sure they got a new cocktail there for you as well. It's always one of my, my favorite things about uh, Marlowe's Tavern. Jeff, I know it's one of yours also. Uh, let me find follow up though more on some of this kind of stuff because i think the other interesting part of this is not just kane's process but georgia's process georgia just got a commitment from running back kenny mcintosh uh, not too long ago we obviously were all over that here at a dog nation the fact that georgia is now uh, entertaining another running back or at least hoping to on saturday with kane on his official visit does that mean that Georgia thinks it's about to lose a running back, either to transfer or moving on to the NFL, which you know both Holyfield and Herring would have the option to do in either either regard? Uh, probably Holyfield more likely to go to the NFL. Certainly, um, is um, is is this a, a, a tell on the part of Georgia that they think they may be about to drop a running back when the 2018 season is done? Well, I just think it's the nature of football. I mean, I think how Georgia's running game this this early. I think ideally Georgia would like to have six really good scholarship backs and have them staggered, uh, especially five healthy backs. And I think with this year, everyone saw that it's no secret, Brandon, how Georgia's uh, offensive firepower uh, seemed much more marginalized and much more effective uh, once they had a healthy DeAndre Swift as well. They were already missing Zamir White. So if they only have five scholarship backs and then one or two of them are injured, then all of a sudden the backfield becomes rather thin especially when you have a guy like James Cook, who really early on his freshman year at Georgia seems more of a, a jet sweep guy, an edge guy, a slot receiver guy. Now, he's vastly talented, as we everyone saw against UMass with his first two real uh, put him on the board and count him touchdowns against the Minutemen. But I think, you know, Brandon, there's another running back that's in the mix there with Georgia as well. That's another young man out of South Florida by the name of D.J. Williams. And I know this is going to be one of those roll your answer, uh, roll maybe an answer that causes folks to roll their eyes a little bit when I say it, but 
Georgia is going to try to get the very best players it possibly can, the best combination it possibly can. And if, if they think that they're, the second running back is a more desirable, it can help the program down the line more than an extra offensive lineman, more than an extra outside linebacker, more than an extra safety, well, then that's the guy they're going to sign. You mentioned James Cook. I want to talk about him for a moment. And you wrote about this, obviously, as a part of your uh, freshman report at dognation.com over the weekend. In a lot of ways, seeing Cook do what he did, the two touchdowns that he scored that you uh, talked about, that was almost, as a fan for me, just as refreshing as anything that I saw from Justin Fields. We just haven't seen much of Cook this season, and it's easy to understand why when you think about how deep the depth chart can look and the fact that you know Holyfield and Swift have been on campus for a while. Brian Herrigan's a capable player. It's hard for Cook to find those reps and find those carries, and yet it's also one of those things when you don't see him for a lot, you start to wonder, well, is he really as good as you think the uh, number five running back in America is supposed to be? Then when he shows the speed that he showed on Saturday, you think, no, there is still a very high ceiling for Cook and potentially a very bright future. I, I was really excited to get a chance to see Cook with my own eyes again, uh, uh, once again on Saturday. What did you make of what he was able to go out there and do? Oh, yeah, it was just great. I mean, another great example of what that class was. I and mean, you sit there and think about uh, – the depth of that class when Georgia signed, I think, eight or nine guys higher rated than James Cook uh, was a year ago. And all those all those funny numbers that we try to stick into the uh, uh, freshman report every week, and that was the most detailed freshman report as well with guys like non-scholarship uh, redshirt sophomores and uh, redshirt freshmen and seniors and everything else like that. There were a lot of new names that uh, showed up on the particip- participation report like Jordan McKinney, uh, Daniel Gothard, Willie, Willie Erdman, Ian Donald, McIntyre, Brooks Buse, Lofton Tidwell. The, so there's a lot of guys right there that sit there and you go, man, that's a pretty deep uh, preferred walk-on program right there with Georgia. Maybe one of the better stats for Georgia, Brandon, uh, that even didn't make that report is uh, James Cook would actually lead Georgia right now amongst uh, – ball carriers that have touched the ball more than five times this year. He's averaging 7.2 yards per carry. Uh, Justin Fields is at 6.9. DeAndre Swift is 6.9. Elijah Holyfield is 6.6. Brian Herrien is 6.4. I think I cataloged all those pretty well in the back corner of my brain. But all those guys, man, all of Jordan, everybody that really carries the ball with any significance for the Bulldogs this season is averaging more than 6.4 yards per carry. And that's one of the most glowing stats you can also add to the resume for Sam Pittman and his offensive line. Yeah, that's certainly true. Uh, it's our Marlos Timer tell with Jeff Sintel here on a Dog Nation Daily. Uh, and, you know, you've obviously written a lot about Tresman, Tresman Marshall recently. You had a chance to speak to him one-on-one going back a couple of weeks ago. And I've told you a million times that I was really – had a strong reaction to what Marshall told you because a guy that we think of as a UGA commit, I don't know that his words, when you really listen to them, if he necessarily thinks of himself as a UGA commit. And it's kind of funny. He goes to Tennessee, one of the schools that he said was among his three finalists this past Saturday, and there's been a lot of online chatter about Marshall on the heels of that. I told you on Friday that as a Georgia fan, I was worried about Marshall going up there. And yet when you hear what's coming out of Marshall Since that visit, Jeff, it's really just a carbon copy of the same stuff that he told you a couple of weeks ago, which, if I'm a Tennessee fan, admittedly, probably is a little disappointing that this was a guy who was, I think, flip bubble, but on this visit, I don't know that they did enough, at least based on what Marshall seems to be saying, which is basically the same stuff he told you a couple of weeks ago. I don't know that Tennessee did everything it could have done with Marshall this week. Now, I don't know if that means he's still coming to Georgia or not, but I, I think that Tennessee, if I'm if I'm reading this correctly, maybe a missed an opportunity to knock it out of the park with Marshall, and maybe, I guess, losing 50-17 to 17 is a part of the reason why. I mean, what did you make of all of that? Yeah, it's funny. Uh, no one was there. Uh, Tresman Marshall was there. Tresman wasn't on an official. He'd already taken his official to Tennessee uh, earlier, I think, during the spring. Uh, Trayvon Walker was there as well. Those guys liked it. You know, I got some information uh, regarding Tresman that uh, I think right now, as things stand right now, uh, most close to that situation still feel he, he's going to end up at Georgia. Uh, that's going to be a story that will probably pop up on the website soon. But, um, you know, those three guys were there. It was almost like they were, they were hanging out and having a good time. Of course, uh, Marshall just knows the Tennessee staff really well. He knows Kevin Shearer from when he was – recruiting uh, for Georgia. Uh, it was Jeremy Pruitt very well. Um, 
you know, those guys right there, I don't think that, I don't expect those guys to be in Athens on Saturday, at least not all three of them. Uh, so, cause that's such an early start and we're starting to put together the, the makings of the list for, uh, for Saturday. Uh, it's showing up on the Dog Nation forum. I like how it's taken on a life of its own, Brandon. Some of our readers are just starting their own list right now and, uh, they're, they're starting their own forum list right now. And I try to sit there and say, not that guy, add this guy, add this guy. Kind of like to be a conductor. And, uh, you know, Brandon, I know, uh, I was multitasking while I was going through our interview process and, I just got a real-time confirmation that, yes, Noah Kane, All right. nothing has changed. He will be at Georgia on Saturday for his official visit. So that's, the a, other dog, guys so that's a Dog Nation Daily Marlowe's Tavern tell-all exclusive, right? It's, we're telling it all right now. We're telling it right now, right now on uh, – <laughs> On a, on a, the Marlowe's Tavern Tell on it. Not as quite as good as those shrimp and cat crab nachos or one of those signature crafted cocktails. That is certainly uh, true. You got, you got some information there on Kane. That's still going down. Uh, that official visit is still going down. No changes there. Also, it's the official visit for, I don't know, Brandon, what's that guy's name again? We, we've we mentioned him a time or two on this show. I think he plays a wide receiver. He You're likes right. to block. Uh, he doesn't mind, uh, you know, the ball being fed his way. I think it's that that Hazelwood kid. Oh yeah, Jay Hazelwood. That, just to jog everybody's memory, sure. Jay Hazelwood. He, he's a he's a receiver that shows some promise, and uh, he's still planning to take his official visit to Georgia on Saturday. Uh, a name from the past that I'm hearing that might show up there is uh, you know he's kind of getting gotten lost and really deep in the weeds, as Brandon likes to say, and all the defensive back with Kyrie Lam and Tyreek Stevenson and even Nick Cross, the Florida State commit, and Lewis Seen as well. But uh, Danny Robinson uh, out of Lee County, okay. a really good-looking player. Uh, like him a lot, like his film a lot. He, he to me, always uh, kind of trot out the quick parallel as maybe a little bit bigger. Jamias Williams coming out. Does a lot of things in the return game, very physical. He's likely planning to be at Georgia uh, on Saturday as well. And then also the – the four-star athlete out of uh, Louisiana, Makaya Tung, is also planning to be there as well. Those, those are some early returns on what some precincts are reporting about what the, the visitors list will look like for uh, Georgia Tech. And you know, Brandon, I, I think you need to kind of come up for this week some sort of uh, some sort of name for this. I don't, clean old fashioned Dog Nation Daily is that what it is this week? <laughs> clean old fashioned. Uh, you, you don't seem to get up for the uh, for the uh, Tech game, and I, I would wonder. Let me let me challenge the audience on this one. We all know Brandon has his certain feelings about the Gators. Who would they, who would who do you think your audience would say? I wonder what the audience would say is the team that Brandon uh, likes to uh, see the Bulldogs uh, put up a big number on the scoreboard the most after the Gators. I'd be interested to know well, what everybody thinks about that. You're not being fair to me in this regard because one of the things I've tried to do this week is I've actually tried to give people what they want, which is, you know, they don't want to hear me, you know, doing a whole bunch of stuff on Florida this week. Our buddy Connor Riley wrote about why he thought there was a strong case to be made that uh, Georgia Tech is Georgia's biggest rivalry. I don't believe that, but this is not the week for me to, like, pound, you know, my uh, fist on the table on that. I'm all about clean, old-fashioned hate. Uh, You know, this week I'm all about kind of, you know, putting – denominational differences aside and just letting you know you know let's all rally around this rivalry on saturday and we'll go back to the offseason debating whether the biggest rivalry is 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 florida or georgia tech or auburn but for this week i'm all about clean old-fashioned hey and jeff as a quick public service announcement if you don't mind can we all remember that it is indeed clean old-fashioned hate every now and then on uh, social media i hate to be the uh, word police here but every now and then on social media, you will see somebody put out good old-fashioned hate. Uh, this is clean old-fashioned hate. And let's just try to make sure we all remember that, right? Very good job playing traffic cop and word police there. Um, I would say, Brandon, I don't know. My, my hierarchy of those, if I had to predict, maybe these might be yours as well, but I would think it would go Florida 1, Auburn 2, and I'm going to slide the Alabama rivalry in there at three because that is going to become a tremendous rivalry for the Bulldogs over the next two or three years. I would probably put Tech fourth in sort of slightly above South Carolina land. I would I would love to hear how you would rank those as well. Yeah, I think that you what you say makes a lot of sense. I guess I will say though that uh, you know Georgia needs to beat Alabama for that to become a rivalry. Now I think there's a chance that it happens two Saturdays from now, but I think you would be a little disingenuous for uh, Georgia fans to say. There's a big rivalry, you know, brewing with uh, Georgia and Alabama if Georgia hasn't beaten Alabama on the field since 2007. That would be um, 
you know, it, it's hard to call that a rivalry. You know, beating them in recruiting last year for the number one class was fun, but it's on the field where it really matters. So for that to be a rivalry, Georgia's going to win on the field. And you better believe if Georgia wins next Saturday, that is a rivalry at that point in time. So I, even though they don't play every year, and frankly, <laughs> only seem to play in, in postseason dates here, at least over the last couple of years, uh, if George wins that thing on Saturday, then no doubt it's a, a rivalry in the eyes of both in the eyes of both fan bases and both programs. After that, yeah, I would see that uh, they're going to meet in the regular season coming up again real soon, and again they're going to meet annually. I, I no no limb breaking prediction here, but I would think they're going to meet annually in the SEC championship game in the bins in the years to come. So yeah, that's just one of those things where I'd be curious, and lots of people have their own opinions on that, but. It, if you want to stretch that, how much have you beaten me lately uh, template into a lot of these rivalries, well, then you can't really say a whole lot for uh, for Auburn and Florida as of lately as well. Yeah, you know, my only point, I'll, I'll make this, uh, you know, real quick. The reason why I have always tried to emphasize the Florida rivalry um, over the Georgia Tech rivalry, not only because they're lousy, stinking Gators, but also because if you looked at, you know, a 10- or 20-year trajectory, Beating Florida consistently is just going to provide a level of success for a program that beating Georgia Tech might not get you. There are a lot of bad teams, a lot of bad eras for Georgia that included long winning streaks against Tech. Go back and look at some of the stuff in the 90s, for instance, when Georgia was winning seven straight against Tech. Not every one of those Georgia teams that beat Tech in that era was a a particularly good team. But if you look at, you know, when Georgia is good enough to beat Florida – over the course of time, that has meant something pretty good for Georgia. It's a 2012 team that won a division. It's a 2011 team that uh, won a division. It's a 2017 team that won the SEC. Now, you know, obviously Georgia hasn't beaten Florida enough, but the good Georgia teams have kind of found a way to do that with apologies to a team like, you know, 2002, which didn't. But you, you, you get my point here. There is something to be said from a overall cachet standpoint about beating Florida that Tech just doesn't provide. Frankly, you know, I'm not that into the Georgia-Georgia Tech thing, but a lot of Georgia fans are, so I, I want to do my part to kind of tout it this week. But, you know, other than this particular week, I guess I don't spend five minutes of my year thinking about Georgia Tech. <laughs> That's a good way to make that point very clear. Now, that would be a Brandon Adams soundbite. Other than this week, I don't spend five minutes of my life thinking about Georgia Tech. There you go. There you go. That's a good one, Brandon. <laughs> All right, let me go back to recruiting here before we let you go because I thought this was kind of interesting. I guess if I've got my information right, Two former Georgia commits have now signed on for Notre Dame's 2019 class. Jalen Perry, the uh, good-looking player out of uh, Decula. J.D. Bertrand, the linebacker, uh, good-looking player out of Blessed Trinity. I, I know both those guys are good players. Any reason to think that a uh, Georgia fan's going to live to regret seeing either one of those guys uh, slip away here, either you know for whatever reason it happens? Any reason to think that Georgia fans are going to end up regretting the fact that these guys, by the way, I guess could be coming to Athens as uh, players next year if things go well for them over the course of their uh, summer camp? What do you make of these guys uh, joining the Irish? Well, actually, one of those guys, J.D. Bertrand, is joining the Irish. I think J.D. will be a future team, team captain uh, for the Irish. I think he will play right away uh, in the middle of their defense. Yeah, Jalen Perry's so, Michigan, right? I'm sorry. I, I'm, I'm messing yeah. up. I apologize. That's all right, Brandon. We won't all, get, get all those, any up, up all, downs. All those Midwest teams run together to me. They're all the same to me. We'll, we'll make sure you do five, 15 up downs after the show. But, uh, you know, the thing, the thing there was uh, – how, what are the odds of that? Because you have two young men that committed to Georgia very early in the processes, definitely in, during the middle of their junior years. J.D. Bertrand was before his junior year. They both kind of decommit at the same time from Georgia, and then they also uh, choose their new school on the exact same day. Jalen Perry is going to be a DB for Michigan. He's going to join uh, guys like uh, Chris Hinton that are up there. Um, I'll tell you this, though, Brandon, on the subject of regrets and players from Georgia – leaving the state, uh, that safety that, that uh, we wrote about him yeah. in the spring when he was deeply considering Georgia, Kyle Hamilton, yeah. uh, 6'3", about 185. Marist is still alive in the state playoffs. He had a big touchdown last week against St. Pius. Now, Hamilton is a young man, and it's funny how the recruiting industry is caught up with things. Uh, he was one of those players for me that immediately when I saw that film, I started um, – writing about Kyle Hamilton as quickly as I could. And if you watch what those um, pretty shrewd evaluators at 24-7 Sports are doing right now, Kyle Hamilton has moved all the way up to the number two safety in the country and the number 22 overall player for uh, 24-7 Sports. 
Now, the composite hasn't realigned with that yet, but that shows true value, I think, for Hamilton in the 2019 class. 24-7 Sports also has him as the number five player in Georgia. That's over a lot of other great players, uh, Christopher Hinton included, uh, the one going to Michigan. So that's the one. Uh, and they'll be coming to Georgia for the 2019 game as well. That's the one I think that, that that Notre Dame and those Midwestern schools, as you call them, that are pulling out of the state of Georgia. When you look at what Georgia wants to be defensively, physicality, size, length, uh, smarts, intelligence, athleticism, Cal Hamilton really checks every box for me from an evaluation standpoint. Jeff, you've been so consistent about that throughout this entire process. You've always liked him as a player, and I will admit when he uh, chose the Irish over UG, I was disappointed. So uh, you've certainly done a good job of uh, highlighting him. Before we let you go and let you kind of get going here with your uh, Thanksgiving week stuff, let me also remind folks that next week is a big week for Dog Nation. I told you about Road to Atlanta a little earlier in the show, and Road to Atlanta is going to be live, driven by Cadillac, at the uh, Marlowe's in Brookhaven next Thursday night starting at 6, p- 6 p.m. It's uh, Marlowe's Tavern there, 3575 Durden Drive in Atlanta. 3575 Durden Drive in Atlanta as we are live there for our road to Atlanta uh, with our buddy, the uh, former Georgia great John Stinchcomb, one of the first uh, among the uh, players on the uh, very first team to ever win the SEC championship game for uh, Georgia was Stinchcomb. He'll tell some great stories about that. We'll do our part to preview the uh, Georgia Alabama game the uh, following uh, Saturday. So we'll do all of that with you starting at 6 p.m. next Thursday night uh, as Road to Atlanta is live at the Marlowe's in Brookhaven. What an exciting time that's going to be, Jeff. I know you're excited about being a part of it. Uh, it was one of my favorite events we did all year last year. I told the story yesterday about seeing all those uh, cars with the car flags already kind of, you know, parked in the parking lot, tailgating almost for the uh, big event at their Marlowe's. And I know Dog Nation is going to be the fever pitch next week as well, right? Yeah, that will be great, and that will be uh, definitely geared up and amped up for, let's face it, that looks to be the biggest week of Georgia football for the uh, 2018 season, at least at least so far. And it'll be very interesting to talk about how Georgia comes out of Georgia Tech and then how Alabama comes out of the Auburn week and the Iron Bowl in terms of uh, which team sets up better to play with most of its optimum health as Georgia gets guys like uh, Kate Mays back. Uh, Monty Rice back. That will be huge talking points in that conversation next week. All right, Jeff. Uh, great to have you here on the uh, program today. Hope you have a uh, happy Thanksgiving, and we'll hope to have a chance to uh, speak to you again soon. All right, guys. I don't eat too much, and if you do, get some cardio afterwards. Take it easy. Well said. Let's take a look around the rest of the league. This is SEC Through. Good stuff from uh, Jeff Sintel there. Really appreciate him being a part of our Marlowe's Tavern Tell All every Tuesday here on Dog Nation Daily. And look forward to seeing you all, Jeff included, next Thursday night as a part of our uh, Road to Atlanta Live at the uh, Marlowe's in Brookhaven. Uh, That's going to be an awesome time. Can't wait to uh, see you there for that. Let's do the SEC Through here for a a couple of minutes and uh, get a couple stories. First of all, I thought this was kind of interesting. There are reports coming out that Kelly Bryant, the former Clemson quarterback, who we've actually talked about in this space kind of a good bit, Bryant was supposed to be at Miami, and he's not going to take that visit anymore. He's taking an official visit this um, coming up very soon to uh, Auburn. Uh, he lo- lo- looks like he's replaced his Miami visit date with a visit coming up for Auburn there, which means that there, I guess, is a pretty good chance that Auburn now, among an entire host of SEC teams, could be on the inside track to get the services of the uh, Clemson transfer. I have very mixed feelings about this. I think there are a lot of SEC teams that would clearly benefit from adding Bryant. I'm not so sure that that, uh, that Auburn's one of them. First of all, if you go back and look at Bryant in his full season as a starter in 2017, the fact of the matter is he just wasn't that good. Now, Clemson was good. Clemson was a playoff team. But Bryant's overall numbers were not spectacular. And in 2019, a year in which I do believe that Malzahn will still be Auburn's coach, being better offensively is going to be paramount important. I don't believe that Chip Lindsey is going to be the offensive coordinator anymore. I kind of buy some of these rumors. I think Paul Feinbaum was the national guy that probably talked about this the most. We suggest this on Dog Nation Daily, even a couple of weeks before that, that maybe it was time for Hugh Freeze to be an offensive coordinator again. And a place like Auburn, given the fact that he has a relationship with Gus Malzahn, their friends, that might make some sense. You better believe as a Georgia fan, what scenario scares me the most if Hugh Freeze did become the Auburn offensive coordinator, and that may still be a little bit of a, uh, uh, of, a, of a long shot, but if he did, Freeze working with Stidham is a lot scarier, I believe, than Freeze working with Kelly Bryant. I just don't think Kelly Bryant's that good. 
And I think that if Auburn really is scrambling to get a guy like Kelly Bryant, especially given the fact that Sidham could go to the NFL, whether Bryant comes or not, I think that tells you all you need to know about what it views as its crop of quarterbacks. Joey Gatewood, who had some hype, apparently they don't think much of him. Malik Willis, another one of those backups that had some hype, apparently they don't think much of him. Nix, the freshman they're bringing in this year, they apparently don't think he could be ready as a freshman, even though a lot of freshman quarterbacks play right now. I think I think that if Gus Malzahn settles for Kelly Bryant as his quarterback for 2019, I think the writing is on the wall that the Malzahn era at Auburn is due to end sooner rather than later. So we'll follow that and see how it plays out. Obviously, Auburn, a big part of rivalry weekend around the SEC this weekend. And it's kind of funny, given the nature of some of these games, some rivalries that we typically think of as mattering a lot won't matter as much this year. I said yesterday that even though the Iron Bowl is obviously, I mean, I don't think there's any doubt it's the it's the biggest rival in the SEC, Georgia rivalries included. I mean, I don't think that anything really compares to the Iron Bowl in terms of the overall intensity on both sides. But I don't think that shows up on the field this week. I don't think Auburn's good enough to uh, compete with Alabama. I think Auburn's kind of quit on its season. Yeah, they blew out Liberty, but that doesn't you know mean a ton to me. Um, so I, I, think, I don't think that's a competitive game at all. I, I, and frankly, you know, I, I think that there's a really good chance that both Alabama and Georgia have cakewalks that set themselves up easily for what's going to happen uh, in, in Atlanta next uh, Saturday. I don't think that Georgia's going to be challenged by Georgia Tech. I don't believe that Alabama's going to be challenged by Auburn. So if you're looking for either one of these two teams to have to expend a lot of energy before the uh, big championship game next Saturday, I don't think you're going to get it. There are some rivalry games, though, that could be a lot more interesting. I think that LSU Texas A&M, for instance, is a, is, is a pretty interesting, pretty compelling game. I think Mississippi State and Ole Miss in the Egg Bowl is a pretty interesting, pretty compelling game. How about uh, Vanderbilt, Tennessee, to be bowl eligible for the winner there? That's a pretty interesting game. There are some good rivalry games next, this upcoming weekend. I don't believe the Iron Bowl is going to be one of them, though. Uh, college football playoffs uh, rankings will be re-released again tonight. We'll have a preview of that on our Road to Atlanta show starting at 3 p.m. this afternoon on the Dog Nation video channels. I look forward to having you as a part of that. We had no real drama or changes last week. It'll be interesting to see if there is anything this week. Um, Michigan struggles somewhat against Indiana. Uh, is that enough to move Georgia ahead of the uh, Wolverines? I don't know. Uh, my guess is the committee wants to preserve the hype for uh, for Ohio State, uh, Michigan, but that's really a possibility. Is there a chance that UCF, after having beaten ranked Cincinnati, jumps uh, ahead of Ohio State, which really struggled against Maryland? That could be something uh, worth watching. The rankings do come out tonight, though, and we'll follow that as it all plays out. We'll make that your SEC through. Also, speaking of uh, Thanksgiving, we were talking about this a moment ago with Jeff Sintel. Uh, cool stuff from Kroger here. I want to make sure you guys are all aware of this, that all Kroger stores are going to be open for regular hours on Thanksgiving Day. So if you've got a last-minute thing going on, that, that turkey that you're trying to cook, somehow it doesn't quite work out the way you want it to or you forgot something, kind of cool by Kroger here. All of its stores open on regular hours on Thanksgiving Day. So check out your local Atlanta Kroger for uh, that as they provide you with a flavorful Thanksgiving. All right, here on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Marcos Pizza, let's get back to our talk about Georgia and Georgia Tech on Saturday. I really thought that Kirby Smart said a couple of interesting things about Tech yesterday, although I'm not necessarily sure I completely agree with everything he had to say. First of all, he uh, had a little praise for Tech. Uh, called them, and I think it's kind of an interesting way to say this, among the hottest teams in the uh, country this after Tech's put together a little bit of a winning streak after struggling earlier in the year. Here's how uh, Kirby said that yesterday. On to Tech today, who's I mean, I would arguably one of the hottest teams in the country as far as what they're doing offensively. They've put four really good games together back-to-back, -to -back, scoring a lot of points, playing better defense this year, and playing better on special teams as well. So, we have a lot of challenges ahead of us. Anytime you play this type of offense, uh, there's a lot of challenges involved in it, especially getting prepared uh, in a week. I mentioned uh, that I don't completely agree with uh, Kirby Smart's assessment there. Obviously, Tech has won a lot of games. Kirby kind of uh, sort of ascribes the the reason why that's happened to uh, Tech's offense, uh, you know, to the, the overall the performance of the triple option offense. Now, Tech this season overall has been pretty good with its triple option offense, but believe it or not, as Tech has gone on a little bit of a winning streak lately, the offense probably hasn't been quite as good as you might think it might be. I've been diving into some of these numbers for the uh, by the numbers piece. I'm going to be doing this week at dognation.com. Go back and look at what Tech did this past Saturday, beating a, a Virginia team that may, may be better than you realize. Tech was just 5.08 yards per play during the game. 
That's a success rate of uh, just 31.7%. I'm getting all of this from uh, footballstudyhall.com. Just 3.17 points per possession in the uh, scoring territory. Overall, that's not that great offensively. The same thing was kind of true against Miami as well. Just 5.33 yards per play, just a 37% success rate. So Tech, believe it or not, has actually won a couple games recently without being absolutely great on offense. Against Miami, they did throw the ball a couple of times, which is kind of unusual to see. But for this season, Tech's been pretty good offensively. But the last two wins against a Virginia and Miami kind of eye-opening performance from the Jackets, believe it or not, offensively, they haven't been that great. Uh, they were very good against North Carolina the week before that, though, uh, 7.43 yards per play. So they've had some good offensive performances in this stretch of wins, but not as great offensively the last couple of weeks in uh, beating, at least by ACC standards, you know, decent teams, Virginia and, uh, and, and, and Miami. So that's worth thinking about. A little bit more from Kirby here. Obviously, when the nature of playing the triple option offense means potential of ball control, large time of possession against Georgia Tech, and Kirby said that means offensively, when you've got the ball, you've got to resist the temptation to panic and all of a sudden start trying to do too much with the possession you do have. He said that could be a recipe for disaster. On that point, I kind of agree with him. Here's Kirby. Uh, I don't think you ever panic. I think you take advantage of your opportunities. You just may have less opportunities. I think panic comes from within. It comes from pressing, trying to do things you don't do normally. I think the uh, number of opportunities or, or series or drives you may have, it may be less. I mean, realistically, it may be less. We probably have less than most people because we've been a ball control, time possession offense, maybe not to the extent Tech is, but we understand those kind of games. And uh, every offensive possession is critical, but when is it not? <laughs> you know, it's, it's always that way. It's worth pointing out that Kirby didn't just volunteer that point. He was asked a question about, hey, you got to try to, you know, score as much as you can when you got the football because of Tech's ball control offense. And I think to a certain extent the, the, the media narrative on that issue might be wrong. I think Kirby Smart's answer is correct, but the media narrative might be wrong. The real issue with playing Georgia Tech, when you look deeper at the numbers, I'm going to do my best to try to write this as cogently as possible uh, this week. The one thing that Tech has actually been better than average at, and one of the things you got to pay attention to with their offense, is they've actually had really good starting field position this year. They average uh, starting field position almost the 32-yard line. That's, that's uh, 23rd best in the country. So the issue with Tech is not how long they keep the football. It's the fact that for the most part this year, they have been working on relatively short fields. Part of the reason for that is they've gotten a lot of fumbles. That helps your average starting field position. It's also true, as Kirby Smart pointed out, that they've been pretty good in special teams here thus far this season. But those are a couple things to uh, keep in mind when it comes to uh, Georgia Tech. Yes, they've been okay offensively, but they've been helped by short field. They have been a little bit better on special teams. This, for the most part, is still a really bad defense. And I guess when it's all said and done, when you look pretty deep in all these numbers, I just don't, just don't see any way that Tech stays competitive with UGA on Saturday. All right, we will uh, wrap up today and uh, certainly look forward to getting ready for Saturday. Clean old-fashioned, hey, Georgia versus Georgia Tech. And I'll remind you once again of uh, something that Kirby Smart said near the top of our program here today, that – when it comes to protecting that turf, sending these seniors out on a winning note, one of the things that will certainly help in that regard is a big full stadium on Saturday against the Yellow Jackets. Sometimes with uh, you know Thanksgiving week, that's not the easiest thing to do, and I guess there's a little bit of a threat of rain right now. We're going to try to catch up with our buddy uh, Brad Nitz from WSB-TV later on this week to kind of give us some thoughts on just exactly what the rain picture is going to look like for Saturday. But... Uh, it's it's not, I don't believe, supposed to rain during the game, so it's a good day for you to be there, a good day for you to make some noise for UGA, send these seniors out on a winning note and get ready to close up the uh, regular season in style. So we'll look forward to talking more about that throughout the week. I'll also remind you here, uh, speaking of rivalries, 752 days since Florida's beaten Georgia. It's our Gator Hater Updater. We'll see you tomorrow right here on Dog Nation Daily. And on video. We'll look forward to getting some of your uh, comments here. Anything you want to react to from uh, today's program, I'll give you a chance to do that. Let me pull them up, and we will get rocking and rolling. Uh, good stuff from Jeff Sintel today, I thought. Really interesting. He was able to uh, provide us an in-the-moment update on Noah Kane, the fact that, yes, Kane is still coming on Saturday, uh, which means that it looks like Georgia's kind of going to the mat here on the uh, potential of two running backs for the class of 2019. I think that's really interesting. We will follow all of that and obviously be talking hopefully more about that on Friday as well. Let me get a, a few of your uh, comments. I'll start on Facebook. Now, I know that uh, some of those YouTube uh, folks will be mad at me for starting on Facebook, but uh, I started, uh, I think, did I start on YouTube on Friday of the other day? Uh, so I'll start on Facebook here. 
John McMillan says, I think a wet field hurts Georgia Tech more than us. Yeah, one of the things I, I talked about uh, briefly a moment ago, and I'm starting to kind of crunch these numbers, Tech is just sort of a weird team to figure out. Uh, I, I don't watch Tech during the season, so I, I don't really know you know much about them, really, until you get ready to play this game. And one of the things that you see is they have recovered a lot of fumbles, and that's typically not a good thing. It seems like it would be a good thing, but it's the kind of thing that, that when you win a close game that, it didn't seem like you were supposed to win, and you realize, oh, they recovered three fumbles. That makes a little bit makes a little bit more sense. So, I mean, Tech is probably due for some for some uh, takeaways to go the other way anyway. But uh, whether it be rainy, wet field or not, uh, but Tech's recovered, I think, twelve fumbles this season. They've also gotten twelve interceptions, so they've gotten twenty four takeaways this year, which has a way of not quite showing up when you need for it to. Uh, that, that's part of the reason why Tech's average starting field position has been as good as it's been. You know among the uh, better in the country in that regard. They've used some turnovers to help them do that. Gary and Christian Gulasano says, bold predictions, Georgia rushes for more yards than Georgia Tech. Uh, that'd be certainly interesting to see. Um, Troy Sadowski, our buddy, the uh, great former uh, Georgia tight end, checking in to say, how about them dogs? Casey Cochran um, uh, uh, on the uh, subject of the uh, light-up Krypton theme. So, if y'all missed last week, and I guess it won't, we won't have a chance to do this on Saturday because it'll be daytime and start of the fourth quarter, but my big push has been that when it's time to light up the stadium for the fourth quarter, that the fans wait and turn their phone on, the light on their phone, when the music starts. I feel like we keep creeping earlier and earlier and earlier in terms of seeing fans turn these lights on with like two and a half minutes to go in the fourth quarter. I think it would just look cooler if they all kind of popped on at once. Now I realize that's like herding cats. You can never get 93,000 people to cooperate in one regard like that. But to the extent that this platform, this microphone, gives me any kind of uh, influence and leverage, that's kind of the way I'd like to try to use it. Is there a way for us to see Georgia fans just wait and everybody kind of turn the lights on at the same time? Maybe the red coat will get behind this too. Um, Al Chandler says UGA by 30. That's kind of my pick on this. I, I, I just – the more you look at the numbers – I don't see how Tech keeps this thing within 30 points. I just don't. You know, Kirby kind of complimented their defense. The new coordinator been better than before. If that's true, I don't really see where that's shown up statistically. I mean, they're still, you know, somewhere like 95th, 100th in the country in almost all the uh, defensive categories that matter. One of the places that Tech has been okay defensively, and this is kind of interesting when you think about an area in which Georgia struggled, Tech's been pretty good defending thirds and short this year. Obviously, Georgia's not been great in goal line situations. So in short yardage situations, the Tech defense has played okay. Uh, but third medium, you know, third and long. Tech's actually third and long been among the worst in the country. So um, this is not a good defensive team. Um, this is, you know, a pretty good rushing team. But honestly, not, not great. I mean, it's just, it, it, it's just, you know, it's about what you'd expect. It's about what you'd expect. Uh, Drew Roman says he thinks the Holyfield may leave. It's a weak running back class for the NFL. I'm not really a draft expert, so I couldn't really tell you a ton about the other running backs coming out, but I certainly think it's a possibility that Holyfield at least considers it. And I, I hope he gets good advice and good information. I'm sure he probably will. But um, I, I think it's at least a, a consideration for Holyfield. Tony Porter says if Tech does not turn the ball over, this will be a nail-biter. Yeah, Tony, I, maybe I'm just going to be mega disappointed because obviously I would be disappointed if that's the case. I don't see Tech playing this game closely. Uh, Anna Martin says, any injury updates? Um, so probably bad news in terms of Monty Rice playing against Georgia Tech. I guess some of these uh, offensive linemen, it's a wait-and-see situation on, but I would say that for the most part, uh, they probably will not play on Saturday. Uh, Al Chandler says, will Rice be back to the SEC? I think it's way too early to know that. Um, so I don't know. Larry Barnes says, how about uh, Jaden Hazelwood? So uh, Jeff talked about this earlier. Hazelwood is coming on Saturday. It's an official visit for him. Maybe that means Georgia likes to throw the ball a little bit more for a Hazelwood to see. Um, uh, that will certainly be an interesting backdrop for that game. Uh, Alan Verbonchik says, isn't Holyfield a sophomore? No, uh, Elijah Holyfield was a freshman on this team in 2016, uh, just not playing a, a ton. He's actually a, a junior right now. Um, Uh, Nick Lurch and some of the folks talking about the Rodrigo Blankenship Award stuff. Yeah, Rodrigo was not a finalist for the Lou Groza Award, which is ludicrous because 
I mean, I don't know every kicker in the country, and, but I mean, I, I can't imagine that there are, are three that have been better than what Rodrigo Blankenship has been or three that have been more valuable for Georgia than what Blankenship has been this season. Brian McPhail asked the $64,000 question. B.A., how many recruits can we take? It seems like a bunch of uncommitted recruits we want to take. So, Brian, let me give you the best answer I possibly can give for this, which I know is going to be wholly unsatisfying. Je- Jeff has written about this at uh, dognation.com in the last couple of days. This is not, to my knowledge, a fixed number. I think it is impacted by the guys that potentially leave both as juniors to the NFL and transfers. So it's a sliding number here. I think that the the best evidence, information at the moment is, whatever the actual number is, it's less than 25. Like, Georgia's not signing 25 this year. How close do they get to that number depends on the stuff I just said, the guys that they may, that they may lose, because you can't have more than 85 scholarships at one time. You can fudge the 25 number a little bit here and there, depending on some stuff. But the 85 is unfudgeable. Unf- uh, you can't you can't do anything with that. So it's it's a it's a number less than 25, and how close it is to 25 depends on some of that uh, other stuff. And you know, privately at Marlowe's and places like that, I've had Georgia fans who actually have to you know, their, their paper and pen out. And they've got you know this guy gone and this guy gone and this guy gone and this guy gone. I mean. There's certainly some some reasonable choices you might make in terms of who you think might not be there, but some of that stuff has changed recently, uh, and that's one of the reasons why I like Jeff's freshman report. There are some guys that weren't playing that are now playing a little bit more. Um, so you know, be be careful assuming so and so may be on his way to find a spot where he can play more. There's some guys actually starting to play a little bit there now. So. Uh, that is certainly something to to watch, but the best I can tell is, um, uh, the best I can tell is that there is uh, still some debate about what the actual number ends up being. So I have a question. Oh, hey, Connor Riley in the microphone here. Yes, sir. What's the to, to be, maybe give a more satisfying answer? What's the lowest? If everyone stays, and what's the absolute lowest? Oh, I am terrible at math. I have no idea. Okay. Do you have an answer? I think the answer is twenty. So you think that's the lowest number? I think the lowest is twenty. Well, that's actually pretty good news for me because I wouldn't have thought that um, I, w- I, w- I wouldn't have thought the number would be. I mean, I don't know. So if you think that the lowest number is twenty two, that's pretty good news. Based on what I've from what I've read on Jeff, George is at eight. Yeah. And knowing who's still out there, I want to say. Oh, well, that's I I take that as pretty good news. Maybe maybe a lot of the audience would as well because what's also going to become interesting here is and, and Jeff touched on this just briefly. And uh, great to have Connor Riley checking on the uh, microphone there. Uh, but Jeff touched on this just briefly, that there are also some choices to be made with, you know, obviously if you were to get a guy like Clay Webb, you take another offensive lineman. But if you don't get Clay Webb, you don't have to take another offensive lineman. You, you take him if it's a five-star. You maybe leave that position group alone if it's not. The same thing to be true with linebacker. If you got N'Kobe Dean, you'd obviously take the extra linebacker but you're not necessarily just looking to fill that spot with just any old linebacker if N'Kobe Dean decides he's going to go to Alabama or somewhere like that. So with those numbers that are also left, there is something to be said kind of interesting for how Georgia chooses to use those. And, you know, as I asked Jeff a moment ago, the presence of Noah Kane on Saturday, is that a little bit of a tipped hand about what Georgia thinks is going to happen with its running back position, at least in some form or fashion, at the end of the season? Um. RT367 says, I'm beginning to feel like the redheaded stepchild. Why is that, RT? Uh, why is that? Um, uh, Brian Kephart says, the only way Tech wins on the scoreboard is if they <laughs> hack the account again and post a phony final score. Will Scott says, does Bama beat UCF in their uh, bowl game after they lose to Georgia? Now, Will, that's the kind of thinking I like right there. I like that kind of thinking. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that Alabama would, would lose and, you know, chalk it up as they have before to Utah and Oklahoma and some of these other teams that have beat them in bowl games of, well, they weren't trying anymore. Alabama seems to be the classic. We weren't trying in the bowl game team. Um, 
Enrique Murillo says, B, the volume is too low on YouTube. Please turn it up. Is that true? Uh, and is it just on YouTube, Facebook folks? Are y'all here having the same kind of issue? Um, uh, we, will, we will certainly pay close attention to that. Anson McMahon brings up a really good point. He says, who's going to be our Roquan Smith against Tech this year? It is true that Roquan Smith last year, by my best count and best memory, had about 47 tackles against Georgia Tech a year ago. I may be slightly off on that, but he was everywhere. And, you know, that this is another thing I'm going to write about. The overall numbers don't speak to this. Tech is only like 60th in the country in terms of total number of solo tackles against. But when you think about anything other than that fullback dive, the chances of that being a solo tackle are pretty good, which means you got to be a good solo tackler. And obviously last year, no one was better at that than Roquan was. With Monty Rice not playing on Saturday, George is going to have an inferior tackler on the field, at least in comparison to its, its, uh, its highest caliber in some of those situations, that's something worth watching. I mean, listen, even in a game in which I think that Georgia will win easily, Tech's still going to move the football some. They are, they are committed enough to the running game, and they have done it well enough. They're going to run the football some. I think the issue is you want to have as long a field as possible to just play the averages and the odds in your favor. Eventually, you'll, uh, you'll get a stop. But, you know, the Tech's not going three and out every single time. They're just not. And that means, you know, stepping up, making some tackles is important there. Uh, Jarrell Ortega says, well, we see Quay Walker this weekend. It certainly seems like um, certainly seems like some of those other freshmen like Adam Anderson, for instance, and Channing Tindall are a little ahead of Walker at the moment, but I'd certainly love to see more of him. Uh, Jay Stinson on Brenton Cox looks like, uh, looks like Britton's on his way back to health here, which is good. Um, RT367 mentioning uh, Otis Reese. Yeah, I mean, Otis Reese is a guy that's been on the field a lot lately, and I really – Seem to be uh, impressive. Rob D says, I'm on my regular volume level on YouTube, and it's fine. Well, there you go. I mean, I don't, I don't know that settles it, but it's nice to know that, that not everyone's having a problem. Um, and Rick A. Murillo says, it's time to let Tyndall and Walker chase those nerds. I mean, listen, I mean, it's certainly not too soon to uh, unleash that group on the world. And as I said, I... Um, uh, I, I don't know how how uh, Quay compares to the others in terms of the way that he's viewed, um, but but listen, I just think that yeah, you know, I, I think that's a great luxury for Georgia. It's one of the reasons why maybe you know all Georgia fans won't be necessarily shedding a lot of tears if Georgia ends up losing out on Kobe Dean because of what Georgia's already seemingly having in the pipeline for the linebacker position right now. But that's not a must get suddenly the way that it would be otherwise, but. Um, uh, but it's certainly Im pretty impressive to think about. AM Fitness on YouTube says, the volume is always low for me on YouTube with my iPhone and headset. All right, we'll, we'll uh, try to pay attention to that. Uh, Jarrell Ortega says, uh, this is a good question. He says, are you worried about the secondary giving up 200 yards to one wide receiver? Maybe I should be, but I'm really not. I mean, I was actually listening to the... Um, the radio network broadcast after our Northside Hospital postgame show on Saturday, and they brought up a pretty good point. Like, in a lot of ways, the UMass game, which was the least physical game you could ever play, I mean, that was just like uh, touch football. It was, you know, I mean, just the least physical game imaginable. That's exactly what Georgia needed. They needed a non-physical game. And, yes, you know, this, uh, 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 you know, this Isabella kid was running around getting, you know, 9 million receiving yards. He may be just be the greatest football player of all time. I mean, he was completely unstoppable, but Georgia wasn't having to. Yeah, I'd much rather give up 200 receiving yards than have to be in some knockdown, drag out, paint, trade, and slobber knocker. You know, given the fact that you know Georgia's got some big football left to go this season. So from that standpoint, I guess I'm probably not that worried about it. Although maybe I should be. Um, One thing on the Andy Isabella thing: uh, first half of that game, he only had 59 receiving. Again, yeah. probably a little bit higher. Most Georgia fans would like, but when DeAndre Baker was in the game, he wasn't, you know, catching long passes. Baker went out after the first half, playing, and that's sort of when uh, Isabella back. And I will say on Isabella, in addition to like leading the, like stats in college can sometimes be misleading. He's right. leading the country in catching receptions, and everyone likes to make a joke. Oh, he's a white, all white receiver. He's going to go play for the sure. Patriots. Sure. Sure. He's a guy who's going to go play on Sunday. Apparently, I read today he's someone who. 
expected to clock in in the low fourth seed. Is that right? So this is this potentially like a second round pick or yeah, something see, like that. Yeah, it's going to be a day two. NFL. Yeah, no, I, that, I think I think that's uh kind of an interesting thing uh, to think about. The one thing about the UMass stuff from Saturday that would concern me a little bit, and I mean this only slightly, it was another like trick play. You know, it was like a double pass that Isabella uh, had some success on. The same way that South Carolina also ran a trick play uh, that got Tyson Campbell beat. So it seems like some of these young guys that Georgia used in the secondary get get uh, caught every now and then peeking into the backfield and, and somebody sneaks behind them. That's one of the things I'd be just a little bit worried about. Um, a little bit worried about. Let me pop over to a Facebook here for a moment. Um, John McMillan says, Isabel is one of the best wide receivers in the nation. He very well may be the best receiver Georgia's played against all season long. Uh, he was he was very good, very good. Um, Brian Wilkerson, thanks for the kind words. Appreciate that. Uh, all right. Well, uh, Mary Martin Corbin says that uh, Connor needs a better microphone. We'll get we'll get him turned up on that regard. See, it's kind of funny. Like in my headset, I hear everything just fine. Um, but we'll always be paying close attention to that kind of stuff. Matt Rukavina says, "B, I want to see our offensive line smash their defensive line, beat them in their own game." Like I was saying about Auburn, there's wins and then there's gratifying. Yeah, I mean, listen, one of the great memories I have in the Georgia-Georgia Tech rivalry was the 2009 game, which Tech, you know, had been this, you know, they were ranked the top five at the time. They'd been running the ball, running the ball, running the ball all season long. And Georgia really did, you know, use that, you know, their own finishing maneuver against them. You know, big time uh, holes opened up with the offensive line. It was Caleb King that day and was Sean Ely. And they just, by the way, those are blasts from the past. I don't believe I've ever mentioned either of those names on Dog Nation Daily. But um, just really beat Tech at its own game. Not option football, but, but you know, essentially Tech's version of the fullback dive. Georgia just ran it over and over and over again and you know, kind of walked away with the victory. I think that's uh, kind of an interesting thing to uh, think about. Um, all right, uh, John Anthony uh, says Tech's defensive line doesn't – let me get John's comment again. Tech's defensive line doesn't look like they're going to hold up. Yeah, I mean, statistically speaking, Tech's just not good defensively. Now they have been pretty good on third and short, I guess, uh, but just overall, not not that just not that good defensively. Um, Mike Mazell says, "Ba, how about some free T-shirts for Thanksgiving? We're hoping to have some uh, T-shirts to give away next week for our big road to Atlanta tailgate there at the Blue Lot uh, uh, next Saturday, starting 11 a.m. So we hope to be telling you more about that later on. I, I can't fully confirm that yet, but that's certainly our hope." Um, K9 Blues on YouTube has a couple thoughts about the class. How about Stevenson, Elam, Dean, an offensive lineman, and best player available are uh, Georgia's recruiting needs? I, mean, I certainly agree with you on those uh, first two. I believe that Stevenson and Elam are, are Elam are, are the two uh, top needs for Georgia, uh, no matter uh, no matter what there. And that, and uh, I think so. I think that's a, a very good point. I think he left out the biggest name. Oh, Jaden, of course. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Jaden is best player available. Right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's right. So the, I think the three, and really, if you want to make make the two that Georgia's got to get, it's Jaden and Tyreek Stevenson. I'd add you know, short behind there. I mean, I think that Georgia has benefited this season from having a much better secondary than it had a year ago. With Baker gone next year, you want that to continue, which means that you got to stockpile that for the future. Maybe Eric Stokes is a better player than we realize. I think that Campbell comes back next year and has a, a much better year. But restocking that for the future and maybe getting a guy like Stevens on the field some next year could be really important. I think that's a huge need, but as uh, as as Connor said, uh, you know, overlooking Jaden Hazelwood, who would be the most important name of all uncommitted players. Hayes would be the most important. I just believe, and not all of you agree with me. I, I certainly understand that, but I just truly believe that Hazelwood could be the difference between Georgia winning a national championship and not. I think he's that potentially impactful. Um, yeah, K Nine Blue says best player available was my nod to Hazelwood. K Nine, that's well said. Uh, Ninja the Noob says, whoever we get will win championships. Uh, well said there, Ninja. Uh, George says uh, um, that UJ is only getting about 30% or less of the state of Georgia uh, blue chips this year. The other 70% going to Michigan, Ohio State, Notre Dame, Clemson, and Auburn. Yeah, it's been kind of a funny year in that regard. I mean, Georgia's going to end up signing, for the most part, uh, you know, a, a blue chip laden elite class, but uh, a lot of that's not come in the state of Georgia. And in some cases, Georgia's prioritized different players. Other cases, the players just never seem that interested in UGA. I mean, if you really want to go look at it, a player like Andrew Booth, Georgia just never had a real, real chance. Christopher Hinton, Georgia just never had a real chance. You know, these guys 
we're thinking about other places from the word go. So it's kind of an unusual year in that regard. I do think, you know, the, the more that Georgia grows in population, the more that the population that comes to Georgia in some respects are people from outside the state. So those in-state ties to the Bulldogs for a lot of elite recruits in the future won't be as intense as we've thought about those being in the past. Now, that's probably an overgeneralization, but that's certainly something to, to uh, think about. Um, Donnie Wilkerson says, Happy Thanksgiving, B.A., and all, everyone. Uh, appreciate that, uh, Donnie. Thanks for uh, saying that. Uh, Cliff Payne says, Otis Reese going to be unleashed this week. Book it. Be afraid. Be very afraid. Good stuff, Cliff. I, I do think Reese's got a really bright future. Um, let me go back over here to Facebook. And then after that, we got to get ready to go. Uh, John William Adams says, who would be more valuable than Jaden if you could take anyone? I mean, if I could take anyone, even guys that we don't ever hear compare, you know, connected to Georgia, I might think about a guy like, say, Darnell Wright, the five-star offensive lineman from West Virginia, or Ishmael Sopcher, the uh, big defensive lineman from Louisiana. But those are not even guys that have seemingly any connection to Georgia. But if you open up the board to anybody, those are the names that I'm thinking about. If it's the... Um, if it's the names that we've seen some connection to Georgia, I think a a, a Tyreek Stevenson is probably far more important than a Clay Webb or a Kobe Dean because I think Stevenson right now is more of a position of need. I think that uh, Clay Webb, now I hope that Georgia gets him, but to me that's a luxury. I think to a certain extent the Kobe Dean is kind of a luxury, although you know, if you're really looking for that Buckus Award level performance at linebacker, Having a whole host of guys to pick from, a handful from 2018, a handful from 2019, is the way to go about getting to that point. But I, I think even Dean is a little bit of a luxury for Georgia. I don't view Stevenson to be a luxury, nor do I view uh, Hazelwood to be a luxury. I, I really view those as must-gets if you want to stay on that national championship path, especially given who, who they might go to otherwise. All right, we have got to go. Um Really appreciate all of you being here today. Huge thanks to Connor Riley and Michael Carvel for keeping us on the air. Fun comments. We're back tomorrow, regular show. Thursday will be Thanksgiving, so no video for uh, Thursday, but then back again on Friday. So if you're off on Friday, you got, you know, Black Friday stuff going on, just watching football, eating leftovers, whatever, don't forget Dog Nation Daily will be here on Friday. So uh, please check all that out, and we will look forward to seeing you then. And uh, extra show today. 3 p.m. It's our debut of a Road to Atlanta driven by Cadillac. We'll look ahead to the SEC Championship and so much more. We'll look forward to seeing you then for that. And then back tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. for another episode of Dog Nation Daily Live presented by Marco's Pizza. Y'all have a great day, everybody.